Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so, so I would like to continue on what I um, basically um, started to do in the first two lectures. And um, what I would like to speak about now is um, not spreading of the blastoderm over the York cell, as we have seen, um, epithelial spreading and uh, deep cell intercalation. But what I, you know, what I would like to introduce here is the interaction between the different forming germ layers. So essentially, the, you know, the function of tissue interaction in morphogenesis. And the type of tissues which are formed in, um, in these early stages of zebrafish development um, are illustrated again in this schematic diagram. Um, you're essentially forming two types of tissues, one tissue which is on the inside and will become the mesoderm and endoderm, muscle and digestive tract, and then the tissue which is not ingressing at the germing margin and which is becoming ectoderm. And if you look already at this schematic diagram, you can see that these tissues are directly adjacent to each other. And so, and, and they're moving in opposite direction. The yeah, internal tissue goes up to the animal pole and the external tissue goes down. And you have an interface between these two tissues. And that's and yeah, assuming that these tissues are directly in contact to each other, but move in opposite directions would already imply that there might be some mechanical interactions between these tissues, which might be important for their morphogenetic behavior in the process of castration. OK. So, so what, I, what I would like to um, um, present you now is, and this is all, of course, unpublished, is um, um, the potential impact of mesoderm, which is coming in in the schematic diagram. You can, can see it here. We're looking right at the axis of the developing embryo. And the green tissue over here and the green tissue in the actual embryo is mesoderm and endoderm. And it's axial, anterior axial mesoderm and endoderm which has ingressed at the germing margin down here and is now migrating <clears throat> in a straight path up to the animal pole, as you can see here in the schematic diagram. This is all happening be below the layer of ectoderm. And the ectoderm layer you have seen yesterday is spreading around the yolk cell and moves in the opposite direction. So you're just looking through the ectoderm onto the mesoderm here, but you have two different flows of tissues. You have the red flow, which is the ectoderm tissue, which is above the green tissue. And then you have this finger of green tissue, which is moving up in the, uh, in the opposite direction of the ectoderm. And what I would like to um, sort of present you uh, data on is how these different movements um, sort of interact with each other and then which kind of feedback exists between these tissues uh, during gastrulation. <coughs> Mechanical interaction pre predominantly. Now, <clears throat> just to illustrate, this is what, um, and I think I showed you this movie before, this is what this anterior axial mesenoderm looks like in, in, in a real embryo. I can just run it once more. It comes from germing margin, and then they're migrating up. And they're migrating relatively fast, and they're migrating as a co cohesive sheet of cells. It's essentially a one to two layered uh, sheet of cells, which is migratory at the leading edge. And they're coming from the germing margin, and they're migrating in a straight path up to the animal core. And above is the ectoderm you can't see in this movie, which moves in the opposite direction downwards. So, so the, the, the motivation of looking at the potential or you know, the uh, sort of the first indication that there might be actually an interesting interaction, um, a morphogenetic interaction between these different tissues comes from an observation where we again taking advantage of the, uh, a mutant embryo. The mutant embryo, the wild type situation is shown up here, and this is a mutant embryo. And this mutant embryo, and I think I mentioned it in, in, in uh, my first talk, is a mutant which is called maternosagotic uh, one-eyed pinnate mutant embryos. These, these embryos don't form a mesoderm and endoderm. So they don't have an internal cell layer. They only have ectoderm on the outside. And if you just look at the end of gastrulation when the body axis has formed in a wild type embryo, and you compare the length and the shape of the body axis in a wild type embryo to um, the mutant embryo, you can already see that the mutant embryo has a very shortened um, body axis and thickened body axis compared to a wild type embryo at the same stage. And that, you know, if you if you um, <clears throat> consider that in this embryo there's no mesoderm and endoderm, already sort of um, points to the possibility that mesendoderm, the presence of mesendoderm, is required for proper extension of the body axis in a wild type embryo, because you don't have that in, in these mutant embryos. It's, of course, a, a pure assumption in this case, but it's, you know, definitely worth looking at. Specifically, what we were looking at is um, the ectoderm, which is at the axis and which overlies the mesoderm, so the tissue which is not stained here, and this tissue down here, they're giving rise to the anterior neural plate, to the anterior edge of the new ectoderm, which is essentially forming the brain later on. 
And if you look at the position of the future brain, which is marked here by the expression of a, of a gene which is specifically expressed in these progenitor cells, you can see in a wild type embryo it's up there at the animal pool. And if you look in a mutant embryo which has no mesoderm in the endoderm, then this anterior end of the neural plate is moved very strongly back to the posterior end of the embryo, indicating that the, the brain is actually forming where the, the tail should be of the, of, of the fish embryo in, in, a, in a wild type situation. So positioning of the, or patterning, or positioning, or shaping of the uh, neural plate is very strongly affected if you don't have mesoderm and endoderm. OK, so, so what we hypothesized is that this anterior axial mesoderm, which, we, which is called precaudal plate, from now on we we'll just call it precaudal plate, this finger, this green finger which moves to the inside, that this is required for um, new ectoderm cell movements, which again are required for proper extension and shape acquisition of the neural plate within a wild type embryo. Okay, so that, that was basically the starting hypothesis, and um, the way we are addressing it was first just looking at the movement of ectoderm cells in an embryo which doesn't have any mesoderm and endoderm. And what is happening? And I just run that once more. We are looking now only at these red arrows here, and we are just trying to understand how ectoderm cells are moving if there's no mesoderm and endoderm in a mutant embryo, right? In these MZ1 appended mutant embryos. And what you can see is that um, these ectoderm cells are all moving in a straight path downwards towards the vaginal pole, as we would suggest from a pibbly movement, because the whole tissue is sort of moving downwards, and the ectoderm moves with the tissue downwards, right? There's no interference with mesoderm or endoderm. As soon as you are now look in an embryo, in a wild type embryo, which has this finger, these precaudal plate cells moving in the opposite direction, the movement of the new ectoderm looks quite different. You can see it over here. The mesenderm is coming from down here. These are the black dots, and they're moving up here. And what you're inducing within the new ectoderm, you're essentially redirecting the movement of new ectoderm cells, which is uh, downwards directed, now upwards, and you're inducing these large vortex movements within the new ectoderm. So it appears as if uh, the upward movement of the precaudal plate redirects the downward or stops or slows down very strongly the downward movement of neoectoderm cells, leading to actually a redirection of neoectoderm movements and the induction of large vortex movements within the neural plate. Okay? So, so that, that's a uh, very interesting uh, observation because it indicates that there might be a mechanical interaction between precaudal plate and neoectoderm which leads to the specific movement pattern of new ectoderm cells in a wild type embryo. OK, so, so i just show you the type of quantification we did to um, capture this phenomenon. What we are looking here is, again, perhaps we are starting with the wild type situation down here, where we have only new ectoderm cells, which are moving essentially in a straight path downwards. We are now analyzing the movement velocity of cells within this window, which I have indicated here. And we are plotting that velocity as a function of time during um, gustulation, essentially, right? And what you see is that these cells are moving downwards, and downwards is a positive velocity, and they're moving at a speed of 1 to 1.5 micrometer per minute downwards. But it's a pretty homogeneous downward movement in the absence of mesenderm. Now, if you're looking at a wild type embryo, which has now mesenderm cells, then uh, precaudal plate cells here, um, then you can see that these precaudal plate cells move in the opposite direction. They're moving upwards. They have a negative velocity, and they're moving between 2 and 4 micrometer per minute upwards. And what they are doing is they're taking along the ectoderm cells, which are just above and anterior of the neural plate, and move it in the same direction upwards, right? So there you can see that this movement, which usually is downward directed, is now upward directed and goes together with the underlying precaudal plate. So we're again looking just at these cells in this window here indicating that uh, um, the precaudal plate has a potential of redirecting the overlying ectoderm cells in the direction of its own movement upwards. OK, so from, from this analysis, what we, um, what we assume is that um, in wild type precaudal plate movements, which are directed towards the animal pole, redirect new ectoderm cell movements, um, um, inducing a large vortex movement within the new ectoderm, which again is required for proper extension of the neural plate and positioning of the anterior neural plate and brain tissue at later stages of development, OK? <coughs> so so that, that's the uh, um, sort of um, conclusion on, on these in, you know, initial descriptive experiments. 
what we wanted to know is if indeed this, there's a causative uh, relationship, a functional relationship between pre plate movement and the ectoderm movement. You could also you know, assume that perhaps you know, the pre plate is secreting any biochemical signal which does something on you know, the ability of cells to move within the new ectoderm. And there's, you know, the, the movement, it's not the movement of the pre plate, but there might be a signaling function of the pre plate itself. So we wanted to see if specifically movement of pre plate cells and anterior directed or animal directed movement of pre plate is causative for this redirection of um, uh, ectoderm, the ectoderm cells above, right? So what we did is we turned to another mutant um, which is indicated down here. In this mutant, we, we knew from previous studies, it's a mutant for a uh, secreted ligand, which is called WINT11, and WINT11 functions in a non-canonical uh, WIND signaling pathway. And you know, you, I mean, the only thing you need to know is that in this mutant, anterior migration of pre plate cells is reduced. They are migrating at a slower pace and less directed up to the animal pool. That's the main defect you have in the mutant embryos. And we were wondering if now in the mutant embryo where the pre plate migration upwards is being um, uh, impaired, if new ectoderm cell movements would subsequently be affected. Now that's what is happening. We look at um, ectoderm flows again in a mutant embryo, and we're looking at this little window up here, which is above the pre plate in a uh, mutant embryo in which animal-directed migration of pre plate cells is being inhibited. And what we find is that the pre plate moves at a slower pace up to the uh, animal pole. It's only two micrometer per minute, approximately. And it's less able to redirect the overlying ectoderm cell movements than what you have seen before in a Walter embryo. The B cells are still moving downwards, and they are not being really efficiently redirected. And you don't induce very large vortex flows within the new ectoderm. <coughs> so, so that sort of indicates that uh, the relative movement of precordial plate in the ectoderm determines the effect of precordial plate on the ectoderm morphogenesis. So you need uh, the precordial plate needs to move fast enough in order to induce in order to induce these large vortex movements within the uh, pre uh, within the new ectoderm above. So it, so it indicates uh, that new, uh, that precordial plate movement is critical and presumably not some signals which come from the precordial plate and there's something on the ectoderm. Now, what we did is we, at this stage, we teamed up again with Guillaume Salbrue and a postdoc in Guillaume's lab, Sylvia Bridolan, um, um, to um, address um, you know, an hypothesis which you know, sort of results from, from these uh, initial observations, these uh, sort of phenomenological observations using mutants and wild-type embryos. And what we assumed is that the type of mechanical interaction we have between the pre plate and the overlying ectoderm is uh, um, the generation of frictional forces. And we assume that frictional forces arise at the interface between the precordial plate and the new ectoderm, and that these frictional forces are responsible for the effect of precordial plate on new ectoderm cell movements, right? And <coughs> to test if this is sort of a plausible assumption, because it's still an assumption, you don't know if these are frictional forces or if there's any other type of interaction we have it between these um, uh, tissues. But it is, together with Guillaume, we formulate this theoretical model, which is based on the physical pr uh, principles of viscous fluid motion. And we consider the new ectoderm as a 2D viscous compressible fluid moving in the opposite direction to pre plate cells, which again were modeled um, as a rectangular, a rectangular element. In this case, it's a simplification. It's actually a round cluster of cells exerting a frictional force on the new ectoderm. So this is a sort of a simplified version of what we think could happen there. And we want to see if the predictions from, the, from, this, uh, uh, from simulations emerging from this theoretical model would be able to match our experimental observations. So if that is essentially a plausible assumption that, that, that the interaction is um, the mechanical interaction, the force generation is a frictional origin. Now, I'll show you um, two cases where we did that. We, um, again, um, uh, uh, look at wild-type embryos in which we know that the pre plate moves up in a, a relatively fast uh, um, uh, velocity, two to four micrometer per minute, and we compare that to mutant embryos in which the pre plate movement is reduced up to two micrometer per minute, or one to two micrometer per minute. Then what we are doing also, and then, you know, just explain, I don't have the slide for that, is we are, we are looking, so what we are doing is we are, um, we are taking a wild type embryo, and then we are subtracting only the epibly movements in the wild type embryo. So we want to take away all the effects of epibly movements downwards, by subtracting the epibly movements which we record in an embryo which doesn't have any precordial plate from the wild type embryo, right? And then we are taking away all the epibly movements and we are just looking at the effect 
of precordial plate on cell movements within the new ectoderm. So the, 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 basically the, the effect precordial plate does on movement within the uh, new ectoderm, irrespective of the amount of epimy movements which happens in a wider ganglion. I hope that is clear. So we are subtracting epimy movements. We are just looking at the effect of precordial plate on redirecting movements within the new ectoderm. OK, so, so what, what we are finding here is, um, and this is a one-dimensional representation, where we are just looking at movement along this axis from, you know, basically along the circumference here, along the uh, circumference here, outlined here. And what we are seeing is that uh, there's an effect of uh, the precord plate on redirecting the movement of the new ectoderm cells, which um, the, uh, the, the red line are the theoretical predictions and the blue dots are the experimental observations. We can do exactly the same here in a mutant embryo in which um, um, the experimental effect is being reduced, as I showed you before, and the model predictions actually fit very nicely, again, the experimental uh, uh, um, observations here. So, so what, we, what we conclude from these uh, uh, close match between uh, the, ex the theoretical predictions to our experimental observation is that the plausibility that these are frictional forces which do the job, which mediate the effect of precordial plate on your ectoderm, is a plausible prediction, and that in principle, the assumption that frictional forces are doing the job is sufficient to explain the, the, the observations we have here. We cannot exclude that there are other effects, but we are just arguing here that in principle, just assuming that there's mechanical interaction leading to the generation of frictional forces is sufficient to explain the effect of precordial plate on new ectoderm cell movement. Um, the other thing which we can actually um, derive from these uh, simulations are, um, here, and, and, and that's sort of important if you want to understand which type of interaction, how these frictional forces are being generated, we can um, sort of derive a, a friction coefficient. Now, what we can, the only thing we can, uh, the only thing, but you know, the, the range of frictional coefficient we can arrive is pretty large here because we don't know exactly about the tissue viscosity of the new ectoderm during all stages of its interaction. But we can, uh, we can uh, sort of assume that there's a range of friction coefficients which is likely uh, to, uh, to be important for the interaction between precarbonate plate and new ectoderm. And by this range of friction coefficient, we can learn something about the interaction between um, the, the precarbonate plate and uh, the overlying new ectoderm. And the most likely explanation based on this friction coefficient would be um, some chemical reaction, um, uh, and in this case, it would be cell cell adhesion, which might be mediated via cell cell adhesion molecules such as classical coherence. Okay. So we wanted to see if, indeed, this um, generation of frictional forces between precordial plate and new ectoderm is mediated by cell cell adhesion, direct interaction between precordial plate cells and overlying new ectoderm cells via coherent mediated adhesion. So we first looked um, at this interface in uh, some cross-section where we are staining the tissue with an antibody against e -cateran. e -cateran would be down here, the red. And we're looking at e localization. What we are finding is that e is localized in ectoderm cells above here at the plasma membrane of ectoderm cells. We also find uh, e to be expressed in uh, precordial plate cells at the plasma membrane. And importantly, we find uh, e to be localizing at the interface between uh, Precordial plate and new ectoderm cells, indicating that there's likely a cateran mediated cell cell interaction at the interface between precordial plate and the ectoderm cells. And that this interaction, this uh, e cateran mediated interaction, might be responsible for the generation of frictional forces, which we assume to mediate the effect of precordial plate on new ectoderm. Now, we can test this assumption, and um, what we did is we did an experiment which I need to explain in a, in a slightly, uh, slightly bit more detail. So, so what, we, what we undertook in this experiment is we took a mutant, the mutant which I introduced before, this maternosergotic granite pinnet mutant embryo, which doesn't have any mesoderm and endoderm progenitor cells, and we wanted to rescue new ectoderm movements in this mutant embryo by putting back transplanted mesoderm and endoderm progenitor cells, OK? So we are trying to rescue, um, to reinduce these vortex flows within the new ectoderm by putting back mesoderm and endoderm into a mutant which doesn't, ha which doesn't form it endogenously, OK? So that's the experiment. You can do that. And you know that, that would be a, a maternosigotic one appended mutant embryo. And then uh, what uh, Michi did in this experiment, he transplanted precordial plate progenitor cells, which he took from a donor embryo puts it into this embryo, and then he's asking if these cells, once they have been transplanted, are able to redirect uh, the movement of the ectoderm cells above. 
And what he finds in these experiments, and you know, this is just sort of summarized over here in these uh, velocity profiles, that uh, these precaudal plate cells, the green ones, are moving at least for a period of time up to the animal pole. And once, and during the time when they are moving up to the animal pole, they are able to redirect transiently ectoderm cells up to the animal pole as well, right? So you can partially and transiently rescue new ectoderm cell movements and reinduce this, these large vortex movements of new ectoderm by just putting back precaudal plate cells into a mutant embryo. Now, why, why do I introduce this experiment? Because what, what you can now do is you can take precaudal plate cells which are wild type, which express e and which could possibly form cartierin mediated cell cell adhesion to overlying new ectoderm cells. But you can also take now um, precaudal plate cells in which you um, impair the expression of e and then you could ask, would e expression in precaudal plate cells be required for the activity of precaudal plate cells to redirect new ectoderm cells? Okay? That's sort of a typical, um, if you want to, developmental biology um, um, experiment you can do. And that's shown down here. So what we are doing is now we are not transplanting wild precaudal plate cells, but we are transplanting precaudal plate cells in which we have specifically downregulated the expression of ecaterin. So we're expressing very low levels of ecaterin at the plasma membrane. You're putting these cells back into an embryo, into a, one of these mutant embryos. And then we're asking if these cells would be able to redirect the movement of the overlying ectoderm cells. Now, first of all, if you're putting these um, ecaterin, ecaterin um, morphant or cells which are not expressing precordial plate cells which are not expressing ecaterin into an MZOAP embryo, these cells are still migrating up to the animal pole for a period of time. So they are not defective in migration, and they still can go upwards, right? But if you look at the effect on the overlying ectoderm cells, this seems to be very strongly reduced. And compared to over there, where the ectoderm cells above move nearly at the same velocity as the underlying precordial plate cells, in case we are putting now precordial plate cells in which are not expressing e or express very reduced levels of e then this effect is very strongly reduced. Suggesting that you need e at least on the side of the precordial plate for the precordial plate inducing by frictional forces uh, redirection of uh, new ectoderm cell movements above the precordial plate. Okay, so, so, so this is all done within the embryo, and you, you still might wonder if that is actually, you know, explaining everything. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to uh, sort of design a reduced experiment where we can actually test this hypothesis in, in more directly. <coughs> and what we did in this experiment, again, that's an experiment um, Michael Smutny in the lab has done, is he wanted to sort of uh, um, generate a um, sort of an artificial situation where he induces new ectoderm, redirects new ectoderm cell movements by not using precordial plate tissues, not live cells, but what he's using now are plastic beads, which have approximately the size of uh, cells within the new uh, uh, precordial plate. He coats these plastic beads with e um ectodomains, and then he's uh, gluing the plastic beads onto a cantilever. He uh, takes a tissue of new ectoderm, which he cuts out of the embryo. He glues this tissue of new ectoderm onto a stage, which he can move in both directions here. And then he's trying to move the new ectoderm in one direction and these beads in the opposite direction, as you would have it in the embryo when the precordial plate moves up and the ectoderm moves down. And he wants to see if he can generate frictional forces at the interface between these beads and the tissue block of new ectoderm down here, and if this interaction would indeed lead to redirection of new ectoderm cells within this block, which mimic the situation in, um, in, in sort of a wild type embryo. Right? So it's a sort of very simplified version of what happens in a wild type embryo, just to see if you um, don't use precordial plate, but instead you're just using passive beads if you can do the same job. Is it a pure mechanical interaction? I think that's the, the question here. Now that's the, the um, outcome of these experiments. I'll just show you first the control experiment where he uses beads which are passivated, which are non-adhesive. If he moves these beads, these would be the green, would be the movement of the beads in one direction. And if he moves the beads in one direction, he hardly does anything on ectoderm movements, which are below the beads in this case, right? But once he has coated these beads now with um, the ectodomain of ecaterin, and he moves the beads in one direction, which is again shown here by the green curve, then he can very uh, efficiently take along um, ectoderm cells adjacent to the beads as the precordial plate does in a wild embryo. 
And that's actually an important experiment because it sort of excludes still the possibility that um, what the precautal plate is doing on the new ectoderm might not only be to induce frictional forces and then redirect the movement, that there still might be some sort of signaling function of the precautal plate which might do the job, and we, we cannot exclude it in the embryo, but we can exclude it with such an experiment where instead of the precolor plate, we take plastic beads, which certainly cannot signal. I mean, they're, the only thing they do is, in this case, they're coated with nicotine. Yes. Um, yes. Ah, here? It's the same direction. So, so they both move um, in, in the minus direction here, minus velocity. They, I mean, perhaps I should show that. Uh -huh. They are being redirected in the same direction. In a, in a wild type embryo, let me quickly see that. Show you a wild type embryo. Yes, I mean, that's wild type embryo. You can see they're moving in the same direction here, sir. So we are just looking at the new ectoderm cells, which are anterior and above the precaudal plate. These cells are being redirected by the precaudal plate. They are now moving upwards in the same direction. The other cells, which are outside of the precaudal plate, they're still moving downwards. And that induces actually this large vortex. So you, you uh, locally redirect the movement of the ectoderm cells, and that you know leads to vortex movements because the rest of the ectoderm is still moving down. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. Ah, so this is a, com a complete ex vivo experiment. What we are doing is all done in culture. So we are taking a tissue block which we are cutting out of the embryo and the ectoderm tissue block. We are gluing, we are taking it into a culture dish which is, which is filled with a you know, culture medium, DMEMF12. You're placing it on a fibronectin substrate to make it adherent. And then we're coming with a cantilever in this case um, and on which we glue the plastic beads. And we are sliding the plastic beads over the surface of this tissue block and sliding the tissue block at the same time in the opposite direction. So you have, you know, like in, you know, like in the embryo, where the precordial plate, which would be uh, the beads, move in one direction and the ectoderm moves in the other direction. And now we're looking at the local interaction, um, you know, at, you know uh, the, the cell movements right at the interface between, um, uh, between the beats and the new actor. Right. Okay. Quickly go through that. Okay, so, so what we conclude on this part then is that precordial plate cells have the potential of redirecting new ectoderm cell movements. That's very clear from all the experiments I've shown you. That friction forces are likely to arise at the interface between precordial plate and the new ectoderm, and that these frictional forces are, in principle, sufficient to explain the effect, the observed effect of precordial plate cell movements on new ectoderm cell movements. And that the relative speed of precordial plate versus new ectoderm um, is critical, and that e mediated friction at the tissue interface um, is also critical for this, uh, for the generation of frictional forces and induce the effect of precordial plate on the ectoderm cell movements. Um, perhaps I should tell you about one experiment which I don't have here in slides in here. Um, and that is actually what we wanted to know is if by uh, generating a frictional force at this interface, if we would induce some shear forces within the tissues which are adjacent to this interface, right? And one experiment we did is we looked at um, movements not on the side of the new ectoderm, but we are now looking at uh, movements on the side of the precordial plate. The precordial plate is not a single layer, but it, um, you know it's up to two to three cell layer thick, and cell cell diameter thick. And what we did, what we did is we looked um, to what degree precordial plate cell movements change as a distance from this interface. Assuming that the precordial plate cells would be mostly affected by new ectoderm cells right at the interface, and they would be less affected when you go deep into the precordial plate away from this interface. And that's exactly what we are seeing, that precordial plate cell movements, if you look at the velocity of precordial plate cell movements, which is upwards, they are moving slower when they are right at the interface, and they're moving faster up to the abnormal pool when they are further away from the interface. Again, supporting the assumption that there's friction forces leading to some shear within the tissue and um, differential movement velocities as a function of distance to this interface. And interestingly, you can also look then in cases where you reduce cartesian expression within the precordial plate or you know, within the embryo. You can see that this effect, that the, that the distance that precordial plate cells 
change the velocity as a function of distance to the interface is being um, abolished in cases where you don't have Cartesian anymore. So that's another supporting evidence that indeed there's frictional forces leading to, to some shear within the tissue of, uh, within the precold plate tissue in this case. Okay, so, so now I would like to tell you um, a little bit, um, and we're going away from pure mechanics here into sulfate specification. I think that's another important topic in uh, development biology is, and again, I think we have heard it yesterday from, from Thomas as well, is how, di how different sulfates are being induced within the embryo. And um, in particular, what I would like to speak about is the potential interaction between morphogenetic movements on the cell and tissue level and the induction of different cell fates within the embryo. And just to not complicate things too much, again, we are looking at this one tissue I showed you before, which is this precordal plate, this anterior axial mesenderm tissue. It's just very convenient to look at it. It's a discrete tissue with, with you know, approximately 100 cells. And we are asking how, how the fate of these cells within the precordal plate is being induced and how rearrangement of cells within the precordal plate might affect their fate acquisition, okay? Now I'll show you just as a um, sort of a, a primer for this problem, I, I show you um, a movie of the precordal plate. It migrates, you can see it here. It migrates from the germing margin, which is down here, up to the animal pool, which is up here. And this is a transgenic embryo, which is expressing um, RFP under the control of a promoter, which is called goose grit. You don't have to remember now all the details, but essentially um, red shows you the fate precordal plate cells take on, which is their precordal plate progenitor cell fate. And the green cells are actually cells which are adjacent to the precordal plate, which become endoderm, which are not part of the precordal plate eventually. So what you're looking at is basically, um, a decision of these cells either to become precordal plate or to become not precordal plate and then they're becoming endoderm. So either to be red or to become green, okay? And um, so what you see here that the precordal plate is migrating up and you can already see that the few cells, few of these red cells might be leaving the precordal plate and they are turning then into green cells. You over here, you have it here, you have a few green cells. But the majority of cells are, remains within the precordal plate and remains red. But this already indicates that cells have two choices here. They either um, stay within the precordal plate and um, acquire precordal plate cell fate, or they leave the precordal plate and then they're becoming endoderm cells and become green. So you have a binary cell fate decision, either to be precordal plate or to become endoderm. And that's sort of an, an interesting observation. We wanted to see how the interaction of cells within the precordal plate would affect this decision of cells and would determine if cells remain within the precordal plate or leave the precordal plate. Okay, so this is just showing you the, the different um, cell fates which are being induced. And so, so, so we got, in particular, we got interested in this problem when we looked at the um, relationship between cell cell contact formation of cells within the precordal plate and the acquisition of precordal plate cell fates. And what we did here is we uh, plotted the mean contact duration between precordal plate cells, which we can measure within the precordal plate. Um, to, um, so, so basically, we're looking at the accumulation of GFP under the promoter, which I mentioned before, goose good, which is a promoter which is typical for precordal plate cell fate specification. So this would indicate to what degree these cells are becoming precordal plate, acquire cell fate of precordal plate, <laughs> and this is their contact duration. You can see that cells which are forming very stable and long-lasting contacts, acquire higher levels of EGFP, and those are more likely to become precordal plate progenitor cells than cells which are, you know, have very short contacts, very loosely uh, contacting each other. They acquire lower levels of EGFP, and the likelihood of leaving the precordal plate and not becoming uh, uh, um, precordal plate progenitor cells is being reduced. So there seems to be um, a correlation between contact duration within the precordal plate and self-fit specification. And that's sort of an interesting problem you can experimentally address and then further sort of um, elucidate. So cell cell contact duration scales with the level of goose good GP expression in the precordal plate progenitor cells. Now, what we wanted to do is to find out if there is indeed a functional interaction between um, contact formation and the acquisition of a certain cell fate. Um, what we did is, and what we usually do in the previous experiment I showed you as well, is we sort of reduce the complexity of the embryo by taking cells out of the embryo and taking them into culture. 
and see how these cells in culture would behave and then see what the human learning culture, how far that can apply to the situation within the embryo. Now, specifically what we do in this experiment is, and the, these experiments were done by Vanessa Barona, a PhD student in the lab, is she took out um, these uh, precordal plate cells, which I indicated here in green, dissociates the precordal plate cells and takes them into culture. And now she's looking at two different types of arrangement of cells. In one case, she looks at uh, singer cells, which are isolated from all neighboring cells. They are just sitting there, singer cells. And she looks at cells which have made a contact with another cell. So she looks at doublets versus singer cells. And then she's asking, how would these cells accumulate GFP under the control of the goose, goose good promoter as a readout of you know, which fate these cells are acquiring over time in culture? The question would be, would the cells of contact affect eGFP accumulation? Um, and would that be a sort of an indi a further indication that contact formation is important for GFP accumulation and fate acquisition of these cells? Now, that, that are the results. I'll just show you quickly the control down here where you compare single cells to doublets. And you're just looking now at eGFP accumulation under the promoter of beta actin, which should have nothing to do with cell fate specification. It's uniformly expressed in the embryo. What we find is that eGFP accumulates in single cells as much as in doublet cells, so it's independent of uh, cell cell contact formation. But if you look now at eGFP accumulation under the control of the goose good promoter, you can see that this looks quite different. Single cells acquire over time a lower level of eGFP compared to cells which are in contact with each other. That sort of supports the original um, claim or assumption we had that contact formation um, you know, facilitates uh, um, fate acquisition of precordial plate cells. Okay, so, so that's what we promote, what we conclude, says our contact formation promote goose good GFP expression in precordial plate cells and those presumably fate acquisition of precordial plate cells. <coughs> now, the, the question we ask, of course, is how is that being achieved? How can contact formation affect fate specification? I mean, these are very different processes. And you know, what has contact formation to do with precordial plate cell fate specification? If you look at precordial plate cell fate specification, that's a problem which has been addressed in, in many studies before. And they looked at the various signaling pathways which are responsible for precordial plate cells acquiring their uh, specific fate. In particular, there's one signaling pathway, which I think I mentioned before, which is called the nodal TGF beta signaling pathway. I'll just show you down here how the signaling pathway looks like. You have a ligand, which um, is called nodal or nodal-related. And this ligand binds to a receptor. In, in fact, these are two receptors, a type 1 and a type 2 receptor. These receptors open binding of the ligand dimerize. They lead to phosphorylation of a SMAT24 dimer, which, once phosphorylated, goes to the nucleus and acts as a transcriptional co-activator, which triggers gene expression specific for precordial plate cells and which you know, triggers precordial plate cell fate specification. Right? So that's the sort of commonly accepted version where nodal signaling triggers precordial plate cell fate specification by specifically uh, switching on target gene expression, which, is, uh, uh, which then uh, leads to precordial plate cells becoming precordial plate. OK, so how can we address if nodal signaling has anything to do with contact formation and precordial plate cell fate specification if nodal signaling is actually affected by cell cell contact formation and might then mediate the effect of contact formation and fate specification. Now, that's an experiment I need to explain a bit more. It's not particularly complicated. Up here, we are looking at the experiment I showed you before. We, had, um, we I mean, Vanessa took out these precordial plate cells, green cells, from a transgenic embryo, puts them into culture, and what she is doing then is she is um, looking how um, single cells versus doublet cells would acquire, would accumulate GFP as a readout of fate acquisition in these cells. And what she finds, and I showed you that before, that in doublets, the accumulation of eGFP is higher than in single cells. Right? That's the experiment up here. Now she's doing another experiment to, spe to specifically address the contribution of nodal signaling in this effect. She takes now cells from a maternal zygotic 1F pinnate mutant embryo. Now these mutant embryos, and I indicated that in the, in the previous part of my talk, they cannot they basically are insensitive to nodal signals. They cannot respond to endogenous nodal signals. And since they are insensitive to nodal signals, they don't form mesoderm and endoderm progenitor cells, right? So if she takes these cells, they cannot respond to nodal signaling. They will not become precordial plate for sure. Now she's using a little trick. She's taking these cells, and she's exposing them to another ligand, which is called activin. 
And this ligand can induce precordial plate cell fates in these cells, irrespective that these cells are usually insensitive to endogenous nodal sickness. So you can artificially turn these maternosegotic binet pinnate mutant cells into precordial plate by adding this activine, this uh, uh, ligand, which um, is not a superficial ligand, but you, you just get a recombinant protein and you can, you can induce precordial plate cell fates. Now she's taking, she's taking cells out from a mutant embryo, which is usually not precordial plate, takes them into culture, then she's exposing them to activine up to a certain stage, and then she's taking activine out of the medium. These cells are now precordial plate, but from now on, they don't see any nodal signaling anymore, because endogenously, they, they cannot recognize their own produced nodal signal, okay? Now she can compare single cells and doublets, which are precordial plate, but which are insensitive to nodal signaling, any sort of you know, nodal signaling which might go on between the contacting cells. Now in this case, you can see over here that single cells and doublet cells acquire the same level of EGFP, indicating that the effect of contact formation on the acquisition of cell fates, the accumulation of GFP and the acquisition of cell fates depends on the continuous presence of activine within the culture medium. Because if you take, you do the same experiment up here, and now you just leave activine in the medium, you can see that you get this effect back, that doublets acquire higher levels of GFP than single cells, indicating that you need signaling to be on in these cells for the effect of contact formation on cell fate specification, okay? So you need to have a functional nodal signaling pathway in order for contact formation promoting fate acquisition in these cells. That's the, you know, the take-home message from this experiment. I hope that is clear. Questions? It's a bit of a complicated experiment, yeah? Sorry? Oh, fact sorting. This is just, you know, what you do is you um, basically sort the cell out of an embryo by the level of their fluorescence. You just want to get the green cells and not the other cells. Fluorescence assist, uh, ass um, assisted uh, cell sorting, it's called. Yeah. Okay. okay, so, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so so you may, what we are comparing is actually single cells to doublets in the first place. But what we also do now is we are comparing mutant cells to wild-type cells. And what are you referring to now? I'm, I'm coming actually to this point. What we are doing at the moment is we are not looking at a binary cell fate decision. We are just looking at the amount of GFP under the control of a specific promoter which is required for one cell fate, which is precordial plate. And we are asking to what degree the promoter activity and those, the likelihood of these cells to become precordial plate is controlled by contact formation. But we are not, we are not yet asking if these cells would you know, eventually fall into endoderm or precordial plate. That comes a bit later. Ah, so we, we don't know yet anything about a binary self decision. I mean, I took this movie only in as a primer. What we're looking at is only, the only readout is now GFP accumulation under the promoter, under a promoter which is usually on in precordial plate progenitor cells. As a readout to what degree these cells are becoming precordial plate. That's sort of a, you know, estimate to what degree you keep, uh, to what degree you do influence the likelihood of these cells turning into precordial plate. But are, I'm not saying that the alternative fate is not in the dumb. That comes a bit later. How do we know that there's not a third fate? Um, how do we know that there's not a third fate? I mean, that's the two fates we can distinguish on, you know, based on our previous studies on this topic, that there is essentially endoderm and precordial plate in this region. There might be differences between different subtypes of endoderm or perhaps, you know, there might be subdivisions within the precordial plate. I don't know. I, you know, I sort of simplify the problem. Say there's precordial plate and endoderm, and and that's what we what we can recognize at the moment. I'm not saying I'm not excluding that there's a finer subdivision which we don't see yet. Yeah. 
Yes, say it again. Um, is it fluid? No, it's not activated. It's assisted cell sorting because you 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 essentially sort cells according to the level of fluorescence they have. So you don't activate these cells necessarily. Um, okay. So so one more slide on on the nodal signaling. I hope that was clear. It's a you know it's a bit you know it's biology, but um, you know what we wanted to know is why is contact how is contact formation actually interfering with nodal signaling or facilitating nodal signaling um, as a function of contact formation, right? How is contact formation sort of modulating nodal signaling activity in these cells? That's the you know the question you need to ask. And what we found is if you look at different components of the nodal signaling pathway, and I mentioned before, there's a ligand, there's a receptor. We find that the ligand, together with the receptor, specifically localizes it, localizes at cell cell contacts. And that's something you don't see if you just have a single cell. Then it's pretty uniformly distributed. It seems to be an accumulation and concentration of the ligand and the receptor in actually endosomal compartments, which are signaling compartments, um, at cell cell contacts. So one possibility from, from these uh, localization studies is that contact formation enhances nodal signaling by putting all the nodal signaling apparatus together at cell cell contacts, putting, putting all the components right in place, and thereby facilitating the interaction and nodal signaling in these cells. Now again, this is a testable prediction to see if nodal signaling is indeed increased in contacting cells versus cells which don't have a contact. And that's something you, you can do. You can look as a readout of nodal signaling. And perhaps I should very quickly go back and just remind you. Uh -huh. uh, a readout of nodal signaling is actually the translocation of this dimer, SMAT2, SMAT4, into the nucleus. If you have nodal signaling on, this dimer goes to the nucleus and regulates transcription. So you can look at the localization of this dimer into the nucleus as a readout of the signaling activity in single cells versus doublet, doublet of cells. OK, now if you do that now and um, we, we assume that nodal signaling is being enhanced by contact formation, that's what you actually find if you're looking at the nuclear localization of SMAT2 in doublets compared to single cells. That seems to be enhanced, indicating that nodal signaling is stronger, it's more active in, in cells which are forming a contact the cells which are unable to form a contact. OK, so what we conclude now is that cell cell contact formation affects precordial plate cell plate specification by promoting nodal signaling in contacting cells versus cells which don't form a contact. Now, in most of these interactions, there's feedback. And you know, we wanted to see if um, there's a possible feedback of fate specification on contact formation, then which type of feedback is a negative or positive feedback? Are we looking here at a, you know, at a, a feedback loop, a potential feedback loop? So what we, what we wanted to see is if precordial plate cell plate specification affects cells and contact formation as well. Now, the experiment we did here, and again, this is an experiment which Vanessa did, is, is a relatively simple experiment, but I need to explain it carefully. So what she's doing is she's taking an embryo, and then she's injecting the embryo with RNA, which encodes for a nodal ligand, an endogenous nodal ligand is called nodal related to. Now you have an embryo which is expressing the ligand within all cells of the embryo, because she's injecting it at the one cell stage, and the RNA distributes pretty uniformly in all the cells. If I say uniformly, there's always uh, um, um, you know, uh, uh, um, variations in the expression level of this ligand. So you have occasionally cells which are, which are expressing more ligand and cells which are expressing less ligand. What you can do is now you can do this fax sorting, and you can um, sort these cells according to the level of nodal related to EGFP fusion proteins, so the level of ligand they are expressing. And you can have a fraction of cells which are expressing very, a, a lot of nodal ligand versus a fraction of cells which are expressing perhaps half of the level of nodal ligand versus a fraction of cells which express very low levels of nodal ligand. These are just the variations of nodal ligand expression in, in such an experiment where you uniformly inject RNA and then hope that all cells would express the same level, but they don't. So you have essentially two, uh, three different fractions of cells which have different levels of nodal ligand and presumably nodal signaling activity in these cells. And you can ask, how would the level of nodal ligand expressed in these cells relate to the ability of these cells to form contacts of different size and stability? And what Vanessa found is if you compare now these three conditions, in this case, we um, um, have uh, this, this um, relates to, I think these numbers are actually wrong. So, so the, this is the highest level of nodal signaling, and this is the lowest level of nodal signaling. This would be the other way around. It should be 3, 2, 1. 
And what she finds is that uh, the cells which are expressing the highest level of nodal signal are forming the largest contact. And the cells which are expressing lower levels of nodal signaling are forming smaller contacts, indicating that the level of nodal signaling scales with the size of the contact these cells are forming. Now the question is, how is nodal signaling affecting cell-cell contact formation? And there are two processes you can look at, and I think we talked about it yesterday. There are two molecular processes by which you can control cell-cell contact formation. One is by um, modulating the contactivity of the actomyosine cortex of cells which are, are forming a contact. And the other one is by modulating the amount of cathirin expression in these cells, cell-cell adhesion molecules. But she finds evidence for both of these mechanisms if she has cells which are expressing a lot of nodal ligands, the expression of pan uh, uh, the expression of classical cathirin in these cells seems to be enhanced. And similarly, if she looks at the phosphorylation level and activity of myosin 2, the motor for actomyosin contraction, that seems to be enhanced as well as a function of the level of nodal signaling expressed in these cells. So it's likely that nodal signaling enhances, there's a positive feedback loop of nodal signaling on cell cell contact formation and which is mediated by the effect of nodal signaling in regulating the amount of cathirin expressed in these cells and the level of cortical contactivity present in these cells. Okay, so what we, what we, are, uh, what we are facing now is uh, a yeah, positive feedback loop where um, cell cell adhesion, cell cell contact formation, affects fate specification, and fate specification affects cell cell contact formation. And both of these processes are mediated via one key signaling pathway, which is nodal signaling. Here we're assuming that contact formation affects nodals, increases nodal signaling by polarizing all the nodal signaling components to cell-cell contacts, which leads to enhanced fate specification. And once these cells are becoming more precordial plate, they have higher levels of nodal signaling. And um, this high level of nodal signaling also enhances contact formation. So it's sort of a double positive feedback loop you have here. Now, this is something, again, one can experimentally address if this uh, positive feedback loop would exist, then you can break it in different ways. One way of interfering with this feedback loop is interfering with the ability of cells to form cell-cell contacts. And once you are interfering with the ability of cells of forming cell-cell contacts, then this should have an effect on their fate specification, right? Because then this feedback loop would not be present, and the likelihood that they're expressing, um, they're becoming pre plate would be reduced. Now, the experiment which um, Vanessa did here in this case is she does a transplantation experiment. She takes a donor embryo, which is a wild type embryo, um, which has a pre plate, which is uh, labeled here in green, expresses Gusco GP. And then she's putting uh, cells into the pre plate from uh, two, different, um, two different donor embryos. In one case, she takes control cells, which should perfectly integrate into the pre plate and become pre plate, like the, the host cells. In the other case, she takes cells in which she has reduced the level of cathirin expression. So these cells should be less able to form stable cell cell contacts compared to the control cells. And then she's comparing the accumulation of GFP within control cells versus cells which are um, you know, less able to form cell, stable cell cell contacts. And what she's finding, and this is uh, still work in progress, but there is a clear tendency in this direction that um, cathirin cells have a, um, a, 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 you know, they're forming less stable contacts, and consequently they are forming, they're accumulating less EGFP compared to wild type cells, which have a higher tendency to form stable contacts and higher amounts of cathirin, uh, higher amounts of EGFP accumulation. You can also use another experiment to see if this uh, feedback loop between contact formation and surface specification actually exists within the precordial plate. And that would be directly modulating nodal signaling within the precordial plate. So directly interfering with the level of nodal signaling in precordial plate cells. That's not an easy task. And what you have to use for that is a technique which is called optogenetics, where you can trigger uh, the signaling pathway in this case by light. And you can shine light specifically onto precordial plate cells or a subset of precordial plate cells, and thereby triggering uh, nodal signaling. In this case, what we are doing is we are using um, two modified uh, uh, nodal receptors, activin receptor 1 and activin receptor 2B, 1B and 2B, which are fused to a love domain. And this love domain dimerizes when light is being shined on, on them. So we can trigger receptor dimerization and thereby nodal signaling activity by simply shining light onto cells which are expressing this optonodal receptor. Okay, that's just a technique which is pretty common now in, in uh, cell biology and development biology. 
Now, what we are doing now is um, a very similar experiment to what I explained before about the Caterin cells. We are um, transplanting a mixture of control cells and then cells which are expressing this optonodal receptor. And what we want to do is we want to specifically trigger nodal signaling in these transplanted cells by light and then see if increased nodal signaling affects contact formation and precaudal plate sulfate specification in these cells, as you would predict from this feedback loop. Now, that's the experiment. You put these cells in. The red cells are the optonodal, and the uh, purple cells are the control cells. And you see that cells, once you trigger nodal signaling, form significantly, form contacts with a significantly higher contact duration, and they also acquire then higher levels of GFP, so the likelihood of becoming precaudal plate is being enhanced by simply increasing nodal signaling in these cells. So that sort of confirms that nodal signaling is a key ingredient for this feedback loop between contact formation and surface specification. Okay, so, so to see if that is um, this assumption that there's a positive feedback loop is a plausible assumption we teamed up with two theorists, uh, Moritz Lang and Kanangut. And um, um, what they is, uh, they, they build a stochastic model um, on a couple of, uh, um, you know, based on a couple of parameters um, which, you know, should determine the interaction we are proposing in our model. So the different parameters which um, you know, are experimentally accessible is actually the unbinding rate of cells within the precaudal plate, the binding rate of cells within the precaudal plate, and then we introduced a constant which, um, which um, describes the accumulation of nodal signaling components of cell-cell contact. We call it an activation of cell-cell contacts. And then we have two, um, two parameters which are important for nodal signaling within the cell, and these are um, the kinetics of SMAT24 dimers to go into the nucleus and out of the nucleus again, right? That describes the nodal signaling activity, and this describes cell, -cell contact formation. And we assume in this model that what nodal signaling is doing, it's um, leading to the transcription of an effector molecule which we don't know yet, the identity of which we don't know, and we don't care really. But we are saying that this effector molecule affects the unbinding rate of cells. So that's the feedback we are introducing, that it blocks the unbinding and thereby promotes binding of cells. So that's basically the positive feedback loop we, you know, I have sort of explained before, where contact formation is positively uh, influencing nodal signaling, and nodal signaling is positively influencing contact formation. Okay. So you can test this model, and you can test it on the, first on the in vitro data, which are more accessible in terms of uh, uh, quantification. What we're looking in the upper panel is now the amount of SMAT2 accumulating in doublets versus single cells. And down here, we are looking at the accumulation of GFP under the control of the goose good promoter in single cells versus doublets. And what you find here um, are, again, experimental observations. These are the measurements of SMAT2 nuclear localization in doublets versus single cells. And this is the measurement, the, the dots here, the measurement of uh, GFP accumulation in uh, doublets versus single cells. What we find is, again, in these, for these in vitro experiments, when we are setting the parameters which we are getting from you know, measuring unbinding and binding rates of precordial plate cells in SMAT2 dynamics in and out, shuttling out of the nucleus, taking values, comparing them to values which have been published in the literature, we are getting to a very close agreement of uh, the uh, um, uh, theoretical predictions to the experimental observations. Now, the real challenge is moving these in vitro data into the embryo and see by using exactly the same parameter values would be able to explain the relationship between contact duration and um, EGFP accumulation also within the precordial plate of a, of a you know, intact embryo. Now, that's what we did in the, in the next. And what we find, and that was quite pleasing to see, is that uh, if we plot now the um, theoretical predictions to the experimental observations where contact duration um, is uh, uh, plotted against the EGFP accumulation, we see a very nice fit between, between these two. Uh, uh, between the prediction and the experimental observations, indicating that, um, first of all, the in vitro experiments are telling for the in vivo situation, and that the model assumption of this positive feedback loop is a plausible model assumption. Now, the other thing which emerges from this model is, <coughs> is a bi-stability, and that comes to the binary self self specification issue. If we are keeping the effector molecule uh, uh, concentration constant and then look at steady state of active contacts, we get one curve, which is the blue one, and if we are keeping the active, constant, uh, active contacts constant and look at steady state for the effector molecule um, um, production, then we're getting another curve. And there are three intersection points, two which are, um, unstable, which, uh, which are unstable here, and then uh, one in the middle here. So, so that sort of uh, indicates that we are looking at a bistable uh, fate decision here that cells could become either precaudal plate and they have very stable contacts and you know, have very high nodal signaling activity 
or they have very, very short contacts and they become something else. Okay, so I just put this movie in again to uh, show you that there are two different cell fates, which I indicated before already. Each of these precaudal plate cells become red and precaudal plate, or you see a few of these cells leaving. They have very little contact or no contacts anymore. They are basically in isolation and they're becoming endodont. So that's sort of an interesting you know, prediction from the model that there's a bistability and that you um, can subdivide cells into different cell fates according to cells either staying within the precaudal plate, have you know, very stable contacts, or falling out of the precaudal plate and have very little contact. Now we can look, first of all, at the um, distribution of these two cell fates and uh, of markers of these two cell fates. And if you would have uh, binary, uh, bistable distribution, then you would say that you have some sort of bimodal distribution of these markers. And indeed, if you're looking at the expression of SOC17 and uh, goose code within the precaudal plate or surrounding the tissue of the precaudal plate, you have either cells which are expressing a lot of uh, SOC17 and endoderm and very little levels of goose code, or the other way around, you have cells which are expressing a lot of uh, goose code and very little SOC17. So either cells are Precolor plate, they're expressing goose good, or they are endoderm and they're expressing SOC17. Now, we, we wanted to see if we can actually um, transform cells um, by activating or inactivating our uh, feedback loop, if we are able to transform precolor plate cells into endoderm, or vice versa, endoderm into precolor plate. And, you know, according to our model, that should be possible. And what it is, we did an experiment here where we um, looking at a uh, wild-type embryo, which, is, uh, you know, which has a precolor plate, which goes up here. And then we're taking advantage of our opto-nodal receptor, so we can trigger now nodal signaling. And we're triggering nodal signaling only in half of the embryo, only in this half here. Right? So we are triggering ectopic nodal signaling. And by triggering ectopic nodal signaling, we are activating this positive feedback loop. And we should actually then predict that we are getting more precolor plate and less endoderm cells. So we are basically switching endoderm into precordal plate, or the other way around said that we are inhibiting the likelihood of precordal plate to transform into endoderm. Now, that's what we, uh, what we did experimentally, and that's what we are getting. Uh, what we find, indeed, is that the number of SOC17 cells on the site where we have induced nodal signaling goes down, so endoderm is being reduced, and at the same time, um, precordal plate is being uh, enhanced. We can do an opposite experiment, and this is a bit more difficult to explain. The only take-home message you, you should take home, this is a mutant, in which we can reduce the duration of nodal signaling uniformly within the precaudal plate. Okay? That's the only thing you need to know. So we are reducing, partially reducing nodal signaling within the precaudal plate, and we are asking, would that lead to more endoderm and less precaudal plate? Right? I mean, we're doing the opposite of what we have done before by increasing nodal signaling. We are reducing nodal signaling now. And what we are finding here is, again, that endoderm is being upregulated in these cases, in these mutant embryos, and precordal plate is being downregulated. So according to the duration of nodal signaling or the dose of nodal signaling you have in these cells, cells either fall into the group of cells which have very stable contacts and become precordal plate, or very low cell cell contacts, single cells, and becoming endoderm. Um, so, so we also, and this, this is an independent study which uh, we, we published earlier this year, is um, we sort of identified a signaling, uh, you know, signaling pathway or you know, a gene regulatory pathway by which this interaction, by which nodal signaling leads to either um, cells becoming goose good positive or becoming SOC17 positive by assuming that there's actually um, that goose good itself, which is a you know, um, transcription factor typically for precordal plate, suppresses the uh, transcription of endoderm uh, promoter, which is uh, important for cells becoming endoderm SOC17. And if you assume that, then, you know, with increasing nodal signaling duration, goose good becomes dominant, and goose good can suppress SOC17, and these cells are becoming goose good positive. While then you uh, inhibit nodal signaling, then uh, goose good is not sufficiently expressed, and then these cells are turning into SOC17 cells. That's just the gene regulatory pathway under, and, you know, underlying this binary cell fate specification you have here, which depends on nodal signaling and contact formation. Now, can we uh, address the... Um, can we address the uh, um, influence of contact formation and nodal signaling right within the precordal plate on surface specification as well? And, and um, Vanessa did two experiments to show that. First of all, she showed that um, contact duration um, is clearly different in cells which are either becoming precordal plate or endoderm. Precordal plate cells have uh, contacts of uh, you know uh, much much more stable contacts by endoderm cells 
have very short lasting contacts. That's predicted from, from our uh, theoretical considerations. And then she did uh, two experiments. I just show you that, uh, them here. Um, one is she essentially repeated the experiments I showed you before, where she is transplanting a mix of cells which are coherent negative, and they cannot form contacts versus control cells. And then she's asking from these trans transplanted cells, how many cells are becoming precordial plate, and how many become endoderm? In a control situation, the majority of cells becomes precordial plate, and the minority of cells becomes uh, um, endoderm. If you're interfering now with cell cell contact formation, the proportion of cells which become endoderm is being increased. That's, again, you know, uh, indicated by this binary fate decision that cells uh, which are less able to form stable contacts have a higher likelihood of falling into endoderm fate. She can do a very similar experiment, and she has to add here more numbers on it. But again, if she is transplanting a mix between control cells and cells in which she activates ectopic nodal signaling, then the cells, the control cells, have a certain likelihood of uh, becoming uh, endoderm versus precordial plate. And if you activate nodal signaling in these cells, the proportion of precordial plate is increased at the expense of endoderm. So when, when you induce nodal signaling, you induce contact formation, and those you um, drive cells into precordial plate um, cell fate instead of endoderm. Um, yes, yeah. I mean, the surface tension would be reduced for sure, right? Yeah. Why do you ask? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you if you interfere with coherent expression, the surface tension of these endoderm aggregates would be reduced. Yes, so, so the cells morphology, I mean, they are just forming less contacts, and consequently, the morphology of cells would look different. I mean, they, they are more isolated cells, which, you know, occasionally contact each other, while in the presence of cathirin, these cells are making contacts and, and, and sort of increase their sense of contact area. So the, the shape of these cells would change. <coughs> okay. Um, she did one interesting experiment, which was sort of triggered again by this um, model we had here. She wanted to see if... Um, Okay, so what would happen if she is taking out cells from a you know a donor embryo, and the only difference she's doing she's keeping one population of cells she is taking out, one precordial plate cells, she's keeping them in isolation for a prolonged period of time. In this case, I think it was 20 minutes, and then she's taking other cells which she has not isolated for such a long time, and then she's asking is the degree of cell isolation having a negative impact on the nodal signaling activity of these cells and lose the fate specification of these cells later on, right? The assumption would be if you take cells out and you keep them in isolation, they will downregulate their nodal signaling pathway as a function of time. They would be less able to form stable cells or contacts, and they would be less likely to become precordial plate. That's the experiment uh, she did here. She took out control cells, directly used them, transplanted them. Then she took out cells uh, from another embryo, kept them in the pipette for 20 minutes. Now they are not making any cells or contacts putting the mixture back into the embryo. But she finds that indeed the contact, the cells which she has kept in isolation, which have downregulated the endogenous nodal signaling activity because they have been kept for 20 minutes in isolation, that these cells uh, have a higher likelihood to turn into endoderm than precordial plate. OK. I think that's all I can tell you here about um, precordial plate surface specification. What's the, uh, Stefano, what's the uh, time? How much time? 15? 50 to 20 million, very good. So, so I wanted to tell you something which is um, really in the making, just as a, a sort of, uh, you know, to stimulate some discussion on it. I need to connect this computer now, because it's not my talk. It's a, you know, it's a talk of a PhD student, which I have not given yet, and uh, so I have to see if I can do that. I think it might be something, Stefano, you might be interested in. So I put that in for you, actually. The, so you have to listen, unfortunately. Um, not sure if anything comes here. Is that your background, Carla? Is that your background? Yeah. Uh huh, okay. Carla, you have to help me. Let me see. Okay. 
And I think we have to mirror them, right? Mm -hmm. No? Yes, we have. No. I think so you have to mirror the, the, the displays, I think. And go down to the um, display. I can I can do it. I think. Can we get on here? Uh -huh. Okay. Let's try that. Okay. No, I think it's not doing it. I think what you have to do is click on exactly settings here. Yeah. And then mirror the display. Yeah. And then you go, where is it? Here, yeah. Flip. I think that's interesting. And then you go into OK, let's go back here. OK, so, so in the remaining 50 minutes, i just tell you about an ongoing project, which I find very exciting. And um, you can tell me what you think about it. Um, it's far from being finished and certainly very far from being published at all. And what we are looking at here is now we are going back in development. And we are looking essentially at the oocyte and the oocyte before it starts to cleave. And there's actually a very interesting phenomenon ha happening in zebrafish oocytes before they uh, um, cleave. This process is called ooplasmic streaming, and you know it represents probably it's you know, applicable to rearrangements and flows of cytoplasm within many cells. But in this case, what is happening is shown in this movie here, and just look at it. This is the oocyte, and what you see here is the flow of ooplasm, which resides within the oocyte up to the animal pool, where the blastomeres are going to form. It's a very interesting process. So just to show you, these are York granules. And the York granules are a mixture between proteins and lipids. And between these York granules at early stages is the ooplasm distributed. And then what the embryo has to do is it has to um, redistribute these things. This is now shown in the schematic diagram. It's not the best schematic diagram, actually. But what is happening is you take all these enclosures here, these ooplasmic enclosures, you move all the your granules to one side, and you want to move all this clear zone to the animal half of the oocyte. And this part of the oocyte, the animal half, the blaster disc, is the part of the uh, oocyte which gives rise to the embryo proper. Okay, this one is dividing, and then the embryo forms, and this is just the food supply. So essentially, what you want to do is at this early stage here, you want to set apart the food supply from the part of the oocyte which gives rise to the embryo, which is the ooplasm. Okay, and that's being done by a streaming process where you basically squeeze out all these enclosures and make sure that they're ending up here. I just run this movie one more time because I think the schematic diagram is actually not very accurate um, to show you what this process looks like. Now you can nicely see it. these are the streams you have here. There's you know one more round of streams now, and all the stuff goes up here, and what you're left is with your granules down here and all the oplasm up here. So it's a fascinating process to look at, and you, you, um, you need to understand how that is being achieved. OK, how do we do that? OK, I go here, and then um, I show you now uh, a case. Where what we have done is to visualize these streams in a slightly better way is we injected beads, and we injected <laughs> beads of different size. And we have injected dextran uh, beads, which are uh, labeled in red, which have a diameter of 0.5 micrometer, and then we have injected larger beads. We were asking how these beads would be distributed by these flows via advection in this case. Now, that's the um, uh, experiment here. Yeah, you have these uh, pulsatile contractions initially, and then the first cleavage is being induced up here, and you induce these flows. You can very nicely see how these flows are being generated and how you flow up these uh, labeled um, um, uh, beads up to the region where um, the, the, the uh, ooplasm is, is um, uh, aggregating. And essentially, you're ending up in an embryo which has all your granules down here and all ooplasm, including the beads up here. Yeah? Uh, yeah, that was not a question, but you had it. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so the, essentially, you have a mixture in there, which, you know, in one case is what we call your granules, and your granules are. Uh, a mixture of proteins with halogenin and lipids. These could be phospholipids, um, you know, cholesterol, anything. There. It's a complex uh, composition of lipids and proteins which aggregating into these granules. And the ooplasm is essentially 
the cytoplasm of the cells which give rise to the embryo. They contain everything you have usually in a cytoplasm, including the nucleus, endoplasmatic reticulum, Golgi, and so on and so forth, right? So, so the oplasm is what you see usually in culture cells as a cytoplasm, and the yolk granules is the food supply which has been at the earlier stages of oogenesis pumped into the oocyte that you know you can keep it as a reserve later on on which the embryo is feeding. Okay. So I'm coming to that. So the cleavages induce the streams. I come to that. Membrane where? In between here? No, there's no membrane. No, it's no membrane. It's open. No, it's open. So there's no membrane. Uh, during early cleavages, these cells are uh, connected down here, continues with the yolk cytoplasm. Yeah. OK, so, so what we wanted to do and what you know, Cheyenne wanted to do is um, he uh, wanted to see how these, flows are, um, you know, how these flows are looking like. And what he did is a, a PRV analysis. And probably all of you as a physicist know what PRV is. And um, he looks again, this is a slow motion now, this uh, streams which are induced, and he has a few particles in here. And then he's mapping the flows. Uh -huh, I have to do that. This is quite slow. And then he can do a, a PRV analysis to see how flows are being generated during this process of cytoplasmic streaming you have here, or all plasmic streaming. It's a bit difficult to recognize uh, a pattern on these PRVs, but you can take that apart and look in more detail at different regions of the um, oocyte. And what you find is that before streaming, the, this uh, oocyte is just um, pulsating. It goes to a series of pulsatile uh, actomizing contractions. And then once the first cleavage is being initiated, you induce streamings. And the streamings seem to be particularly pronounced in central regions where the oplasm is streaming upwards. And there seem to be a backflow on the margin of the oocyte where um, uh, your granules are moving in, in the opposite direction. Okay, so, so this is sort of, sort of shown here in, you know, by looking at um, uh, chymographs, where we're looking at flows along the, um, you know, along the animal vegetal axis as a function of time during this flowing process. And if you just look here, that um, flows are being um, red is positive flow, which is directed upwards, and blue is flow, which is directing downwards. Okay, and you get upward flows, and you know, in a in a, a, a progressing fashion, initiated in animal regions. And there, the flows are being initiated, which are upward directed, and then these upward flows are moving downwards towards the vaginal pole. So you induce oplasmic streaming initially very close to the um, blaster disc, which is already present, and then this propagates down to the vaginal pole. So you initiate flows in an animal to vaginal direction. And if you look now at flows along the left-right axis, or around the circumference in this case, what you can see is at the stage when you induce flows in the middle, which go upwards, you can see that you get back flows on the margin, which are directed downwards, which are blue. So um, just in a, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to tell you here is that what you're having is flows which are going in central regions up, which lead to the segregation of oplasm and um, yolk granules. And then you have some backward flows on the margin, which are pointing in the opposite direction. OK, so, so we obviously wanted to know um, how these flows are being generated. And you know, one prime candidate for that is the um, actomyzine cytoskeleton again, and presumably actomyzine contraction of the cytoskeleton. And we did a couple of experiments where we were interfering with the actomyzine cytoskeleton and with its, with its contractile ability by interfering uh, with actin polymerization and with uh, the activity of uh, uh, rho kinase, which activates rho A and subsequently myosin activity. Now, we are treating <coughs> embryos with these inhibitors, and we are asking how flows would be affected in these embryos. And that's not too surprisingly what we find is um, that in uh, cases where we uh, interfere with the actin cytoskeleton or with myosin activity, the flows are very strongly or strongly affected, um, indicating that you need actin and actin cytoskeleton and actomyosin contraction for proper induction of um, these oplasmic flows in embryos. Okay. Now, this is just a, a summary of, of loads of different inhibitor experiments he has done. He has um, interfered with F-actin um, by inducing F-actin depolymerization. He has interfered with rho kinase to interfere with myosin activity. 
he has looked at you know, interfering with ARP2 mediated branch active polymerization, um, filamentous active polymerization, and again with, um, uh, with the myosin activity directly. And in all these cases, in, you know, just as a summary, in all these cases, when he inhibits, when he interferes with the integrity of the actin cytoskeleton or its contractile um, properties, he can very strongly interfere with uh, the streaming of ooplasm outputs, indicating that you need to have a contractile actomyosin network to induce this streaming. Um, okay. So now the question is, how would actomyosin induce these streamings? And that's really what, he, what we all want to understand. And you know, but the first thing is he looked at the dynamic distribution of actin during the ooplasmic streaming process. What you find is that there's actin which is at the cortex, which you can very nicely see around here, and then there's actin which is within the bulk of the cytoplasm. And um, you can now see the streams are happening, and you get the first cleavage up here, and then they're silent again, and the stream is being induced again once the, f the next cleavage is being initiated. Um, so you get basically a dynamic redistribution of the actomyosin inside the skeleton during the streams. And that's something he analyzed in a bit more detail than in the subsequent slides to understand which kind of interaction are happening. First of all, what he looked is at the cortical actomyosin inside the skeleton. And uh, what he did is he looked at the intensity of actin at the cortex of these cells during different stages of ooplasmic streaming. And he also looked at the uh, accumulation of myosin 2 at the uh, cortex in the same embryos. And he looks at stages before streaming, and then during the streaming, and at the end of streaming. And this is a chymograph that shows you the distribution of um, actin and the distribution of myosin at the animal pole and vegetal pole during the streaming process. And what you find is that there is a pulsatile accumulation of actin at the animal pool. And then it goes away when streaming is setting in. Then it goes back to the cortex when streaming stops. Then it goes away from the cortex when streaming is on, and so on, right? And very similar but less uh, uh, clear myosin accumulates. It seems to be that if you look at cortical actin accumulation, that cortical actin decreases at the animal pole when streaming is setting in. Um, what he also then looked is not at cortical act actin, but at the, uh, the, the actin within the bulk of the cytoplasm of the oocyte. What he finds is actually, and you can just look down here, a very interesting um, a regulation where the cytoplasmic actin increases and the cortical actin decreases. So if you, if you look at the animal pole of the embryo, the cortical actin goes down, streaming is setting in, and at the same time when streaming is setting in, you accumulate actin within the cytoplasm, poly polymerized actin within the cytoplasm. So actin um, appears to be in, in two different localizations. It's either at the cortex when streaming is off, or it's in the cytoplasm when streaming is on. OK, that's just a summary of it. And um, so he was wondering, how do, you, how do you induce this fluctuation of actin from the cortex to the cytoplasm? And what he found is that this uh, is tightly correlating in a spatial temporal manner with the um, induction of the first mitotic division, the first cleavage. And what he finds is in uh, metaphase uh, and anaphase, from metaphase to anaphase, that um, the, uh, the uh, first mitotic division and subsequent mitotic divisions trigger the accumulation of actin within the bulk of the cytoplasm and um, the relocalization of actin from the cortex into the cytoplasm. So that seems to be a cell cycle regulated effect um, on the redistribution of actin. So what he concludes here is that actin tase, he calls that actin tase, is polymerized actin structures here, that they uh, appear and propagate during metaphase. Now, what he really finds, and you know, that's just, yeah? Yeah, it um, starts at the nucleus and then it propagates out from the nucleus. Exactly, that's what I'm what I'm trying to show here. And I think there's even a movie in here. If I'm not taking wrong. Yes, yeah, so you can see it here, and you know that with the nucleus, and then you know you get this actin cytoplasmic polymerization, which emerges from the nucleus during the division, and um, and spreads into the cytoplasm. So you initiate a wave of uh, actin polymerization at the animal pool where this cleavage is happening, and this propagates from the animal down to the vegetal pool. That's interesting because um, yeah, I indicated it before. When you look at the flow of ooplasm, the flow of ooplasm is first uh, induced at the animal pole, and then this flow induction propagates from the animal to the vegetal pole. So together with this um, polymerization of actin 
within the cytoplasm, a bulk acting within the cytoplasm, you induce ooplasmic flows. Um, okay, and, and that's very reminiscent to other studies by Tim Mitchison and others which have shown that the centrosome can actually act as a chemical signaling center and, and, and U, U data do support that as well, I think. Um, so so what, we, what we speculate here at this point is that um, the centrosomes trigger actin polymerization during the first cleavage, and this actin polymerization then um, is, is required or, you know, functionally relates to the adduction of ooplasmic streaming within the oocyte. Okay, but then the question is, where is, uh, um, um, where is the force created which is needed for um, this ooplasmic streaming? And uh, he did an interesting experiment. What he did is he took the embryo, and then he um, generated two embryos out of that, took the oocyte, and he um, generated two pieces of oocyte. He took the animal pole, cut it off, and then take the vegetal pole, and he asked, can he induce oplasmic streaming in both of these things? One contains the nucleus, the other one doesn't contain the nucleus, okay? And surprisingly, and that's something we cannot really explain, um, if you look at this thing here, he calls it mini embryos. Um, this would be the animal, and you see very nice streams of oplasma up here, but even in this vegetal uh, part, which doesn't contain a nucleus, there's no division, you can induce these streams. So there's some sort of pre-pattern of the oocyte which goes all the way from the animal to the vegetal pole, which is retained even if you take away the actual uh, division, and still, you know, the, 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 this piece here, this vegetal piece has a polarity. I come to that. I think that, that's a very good experiment. Um, <coughs> <coughs> so what we, <coughs> what we really wanted to know is um, what is triggering these flows. And there were two um, sort of you know, main hypotheses which um, derive from what we have seen here. I told you that actin, cortical actin goes down at the animal pole and cytoplasmic actin increases. And um, so one you know, easy explanation would be that um, what you do is you uh, reduce cortical tension up here by the polymerizing cortical actin, this leads to a deformation of this uh, region of the, the oocyte, and together with the deformation, you induce a stream, and ooplasm streams faster than uh, your granules, and then you get a segregation. So there was basically a model and that had been proposed in previous studies. Yeah? Uh, so if I understand correctly, the CPI is that these flows create the duration of your granules. It's creating the segregation of your granules from ooplasm. Yeah, we can perhaps, you know, I go through the experiments and then we can discuss this point a bit more, right? I mean, then there are a couple of more experiments which might be then uh, explaining what you're, what you're asking. Now, this would be a sort of a very simple experiment that you change the surface tension at the animal pole by uh, um, reducing cortical actomycin. This leads to a local blep formation up here, which would be the blaster disc, and this induces streams within the uh, oocyte, which leads to the segregation. Okay, that, that was an experiment we could actually address, and the, the idea which uh, um, uh, um, Cheyenne had is actually creating a cortex broken embryo. That basically what he's doing is he's putting an embryo into a, a very uh, small confinement, then he presses onto the embryo, up it explodes. Now it has no cortex anymore. So what you find is that you still induce flows in cases where there's no intact actomizing cortex anymore. You get very efficient flows in, in these extracts of uh, oplasm, if you want so, which contains your granules and oplasm. Um, so, so that sort of tells you you don't need an intact actomycin cortex for inducing uh, efficient segregation of your granules from oplasm. Yeah. No, you have it already at this stage. You have already the pronucleus up there. So everything, you know, you have already a polarity along the animal vaginal axis when all that happens. Yeah, the oocyte is polarized. Let's say for, uh, let's say for to go on even in the cytoplasm without the nuclear. Right? Let's say, I am, yeah. Like when you make it cytoplasmic, you yeah. get the cytoplasmic. Yeah, yeah. Get perhaps, you know, that's explaining why the vegetal embryo still has a polarity because it contains probably the information. Right, still, right? still Exactly, yeah. yeah. I think that's a good point, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
you should use your. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so the cortex broken MBO sort of indicates that cortical actomycin is dispensable for the flows. So, what we wanted really to know is if this bulk actin polymerization is actually essential for the flow. And um, so, what um, um, what we speculate at this point is that myosin 2 accumulates at the surface of your granules and that the constriction of the actomyosin uh, network propels granules vegetarily. So if you think about a model where we have a sponge, we're compressing the yolk granules and squeeze out the oplasm in a directional manner by having a wave of actin polymerization which progresses from the animal pole down to the vegetable pole. Now, if you look at these different movies, that's you know um, some supporting information on that model. Here we're looking at uh, the emergence of this actin polymerization wave, which comes from here. These are yolk granules. You can see that these yolk granules are very strongly moved downwards. This would be vegetable, and this is animal, by the wave arriving from the animal pool and moving downwards, right? So you can nicely see that, that you can move yolk granules by simply triggering actin polymerization and contraction in a, in a wave-like fashion from the animal down to the vegetable pool. And likewise, you can look at myosin. And again, the wave would arrive from here, and you move these yolk granules downwards, and then there's some relaxation once the wave has passed, but there's a net translocation of your granules downwards by this wave, which propagates from the animal down to the vegetable. Okay. Um, so, so essentially what we, you know, I'll leave you here with this model because this is far from being finished. What we propose is there is a polymerization wave which is initiated at the animal pool by, you know, by the division machinery that propagates from the animal pool down to the vegetable pool. This is a cytoplasmic actin bulk network contraction, which by moving from the animal down to the vegetable pool contracts and moves together these yolk granules and thereby squeezes the oplasm in the opposite direction upwards. The reason why you get streams in the medial region and not in more lateral regions might be that you have on top of it in an intact embryo, you have this deformation up here which might bias the flow into more central regions versus marginal regions. And um, that's pretty much uh, all I wanted to tell you. Thank you.